I'm sure you all know the classic Pokemon slogan, gotta catch them all. While that may not be possible in newer generations, catching has been an important mechanic throughout Pokemon games. However, many of these games can actually be completed without capturing any wild Pokemon. I wanted to try a no catching challenge out for myself, but with a slight twist. Instead of answering the question, can we beat Pokemon Pearl without catching any Pokemon, I wanted to see if we could collect a Pokemon of every single type without throwing a single Pokeball. This means that the run will end once we have at least one Pokemon representing each of the 17 types in our PC box. All of the Pokemon we count toward this total must be acquired from Pokemon Pearl, so we can't trade a Pokemon like Dratini into our game to count as our Dragon type, for example. To make this challenge even more difficult, I decided to restart the game if any of my Pokemon happened to faint. So, can we collect a Pokemon of every single type without having to catch any wild Pokemon? Let's find out! The first Pokemon we received was our starter, which we stole from the Professor's briefcase. I picked Turtwig, and named it Grass to represent its type. One down, 16 more to go. Dawn taught me how to catch a Pokemon, so I took some really detailed notes to prepare for all of the catching we're going to do. We moved on to Jubilife City, received the Poketch, and defeated our rival with our overleveled Turtwig. We made our way to Orberg and took on the first gym. After beating the first gym trainer, Turtwig evolved into Grottle, making Rourke even easier to defeat. We returned to Jubilife City, battled some Team Galactic grunts, then entered the Ravaged Path. We had to teach Grottle Rock Smash to travel through here, so we got rid of Curse to make room for the HM. The Valley Windworks were simple, as Grottle knocked out Mars' Zubat with Tackle and her Perugly with Razor Leaf. We made our way through Eterna Forest with Cheryl and arrived in Eterna City. We entered the house next to the Pokemon Center and picked up the Explorer Kit, which allowed us to traverse the Underground. The Underground is an area in Sinnoh where you can mine for a variety of useful items, such as Revise, Evolution Stones, and Heart Scales. We weren't really concerned about these items, as we were down here for something else. After about an hour of searching, we found what we were looking for, two armor fossils. We returned to Orberg City and entered the Mining Museum, where we revived these fossils into two Shieldon. Since Shieldon is a dual rock-steel type, we named one of them rock and one steel. Fourteen types left. The next major battle was with Gardenia, the Eterna City Gym Leader. After using an X-Attack and X-Defend, we used Bite to knock out all of her Pokémon, earning us the second Gym Badge. The Team Galactic Eterna building was blocked off by thin trees, so we had to teach one of our Pokémon Cut. The only Pokemon that could learn it was Grottle, so we taught yet another HM to the Pokemon. We entered the building and defeated the Grunts, then got cold feet and did a bit of grinding. Our starter evolved once more, but this time it gained a new type upon evolution, Ground. I wanted to have a unique Pokemon for each type, so Torterra will only represent the Ground type and not both Grass and Ground. We'll get another Grass type later. We gave it the appropriate nickname and returned to battle Jupiter, who we now beat with ease. Our next stop was Heart Home City, where we battled our rival for the second time. We defeated his Starly with Rock Tomb, Monferno with Earthquake, Weasel with Razor Leaf, and Roselia with Earthquake. We talked to a random hiker in the city as well, and he graciously offered us a Pokemon egg. Inside that egg was the normal type Hapini, allowing us to mark off another type in our chart. The final location we needed to go to in Heart Home was Amity Square. In order to enter this area, we needed to have a cute Pokemon in our party, so luckily the Hapini that we just hatched did the trick. We picked up some useful items in Amity Square and made our way to Silesian Town. Silesian Town has the Pokemon Daycare, which is crucial for completing this challenge. We deposited our female Torterra and our male Shieldon into the daycare, and because they are both in the monster egg group, they laid an egg. After a bit of cardio, the egg was finally ready to hatch, giving us a second Turtwig. We named it Grass for old time's sake and added it back to our chart. We made our way to Veilstone City and battled the third gym. This was a breeze though, as we just had Torterra spam Earthquake to one-shot all of Maylene's Pokemon. Before going to Pastoria City, we took a detour to visit the Lost Tower, where we picked up the Oval Stone and the HM for strength. We gave the Oval Stone to Hapini and evolved it into Chansey, then got Shield on to level 30 to evolve into Bastiodon. We arrived in Pastoria City and took on Crasher Wake. We boosted our stats with X items and had Gyarados boost our attack stat for us with Swagger, then swept his team with Torterra. 
Before we could follow the Team Galactic Grant to Valor Lakefront, Ketchis challenged us to another Pokemon battle. However, with a simple Rock Smash, two Earthquakes, and a Razor Leaf, we easily knocked out all of his Pokemon. We defeated the aforementioned Galactic Grunt, received the secret potion from an unimportant side character, then used the potion on the side of blocking our path to compel them to move. We traversed the fog on Route 210 and arrived in Celestic Town. After receiving a pair of black glasses from a shady man, we battled another Galactic Grunt and got the HM for Surf from Cynthia's grandmother. Our next challenge was beating Fantina, the Heart Home City Gym Leader. This wasn't actually that challenging though, as we just increased our stats with more X items and swept her team with Bastiodon. What would prove to be challenging came next. I returned to Jubilife City, set foot onto Route 218, and booted up the HM Surf, which none of my Pokemon could learn. We can't continue the run without Surf, as we need to pass through this watery route to get to Canalave City. So, the run ends here. And you, in fact, cannot collect every type in Pokemon Pearl without catching Pokemon. Is what I would say if I didn't have one more trick up my sleeve. The answer to this problem is found in Jubilife City, and we actually started planning for this situation right after the first gym. After the team up battle with Dawn against the two Team Galactic Grunts, an NPC gave me the fashion case and informed me that the Jubilife TV station was now open. We didn't care much for the case, but decided to visit the TV station and walked up to the third floor of the building. There, we met a TV producer and decided to participate in his survey. We answered his questions in a very specific manner, compelling him to add the mystery gift option to our game. Since generation two, mystery gift has existed to gift players exclusive Pokemon within a certain time frame. The gen four games have had their fair share of mystery gift Pokemon, but this service has since been suspended. On May 20th, 2014, Nintendo discontinued their Wi-Fi connection service for the DS, preventing players from accessing online features in Pokemon games, Mystery Gift included. In order to receive these exclusive Pokemon, we'd have to go back in time to when these events occurred and the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection still worked. Or we could just trick the DS to think that. That's right, we can actually unlock Mystery Gift Pokemon from all the way back in 2008. By using a specific DNS and an open network, we can trick the DS into thinking that the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection service still works, causing the game to search the pool of all past Mystery Gift Pokemon and present us with one of them. So, we decided to collect some gifts. The first Pokemon we received was an Arceus from a 2009 Toys R Us distribution. We went to the Pokemon and talked to the delivery man, who gave us the event Pokemon. While we already had a normal type, Arceus's ability multi-type allows it to change its type to match the plate it's currently holding. Since we picked up a spooky plate from Ebony Square earlier, we gave it to Arceus and changed its type to Ghost. We shuffled through a couple more event Pokemon until we got one entitled Battle and Kona. This was a Crobat from the 2010 Pokemon World Championships in Hawaii, so we accepted it as our poison type. The final Pokemon we got from this exploit was a Dragonite from a 2008 Toys R Us event, which became our Dragon type. Granted, we could have got more Pokemon from this exploit and finished this challenge right here, but I chose not to. While the trick is necessary to get these three specific types, we can use other methods to receive the remaining nine. I wanted to use Mystery Gift as little as possible, as I felt it wouldn't be true to the nature of the challenge to have most of our Pokemon come from an exploit. For this reason, I also would not use any of these Pokemon in battle, as our level 100 Arceus would make the no fainting rule seem obsolete taking away half the challenge. This doesn't mean I won't use them at all though. While we can't use them in battle, we can use them outside of battle, and since Dragonite can learn Surf, we taught at the HM, traversed Route 218, and moved on to Canalave City. The move deleter lives in Canalave City, so we finally deleted Rock Smash and Cut from Torterra's move pool and gave these HMs to our spare Turtwig. After teaching Torterra some better moves, we battled Catches again. Bastiodon could tank all of Staravia's attacks so he led with it, abused some X items, and swept his team. We then went to Iron Island and met Riley, who allowed us to train our Pokemon twice as fast with the double battle format. That wasn't the only reason we accompanied Riley through the mine, though. After we defeated some Galactic Grunts together, Riley offered me a Pokemon egg, which hatched into Riolu. We evolved Riolu into Lucario, then trained it a bit to prepare for the Steel type gym. Because we took the time to level up a fighting type, this gym was one of the easiest fights we've had in a while.
Team Galactic set off their bomb at Lake Valor, although somehow all of the Magikarp in the lake survived. We entered the Valor Cavern and defeated Saturn, then went to Lake Verity to defeat Mars as well. After traveling through Mount Coronet, Route 216, and Route 217, we reached Snowpoint City and took on its gym. We boosted Lucario's stats and swept Candace's team, earning us the 7th gym badge. Next, we traveled back to Veilstone to tackle Team Galactic's headquarters, where we had to battle Cyrus and Saturn. Cyrus's Murkrow and Golbat were countered by Basudon, and Lucario countered a Sneasel. Saturn was a little tougher, so we used a few X items, but still easily swept his team with Torterra. Team Galactic then went to Mount Coronet to further the plot, so we followed them to the summit. Cyrus summoned Palkia with the Red Chain, but before we could battle him, we had to defeat Mars and Jupiter with our rival in a double battle. We took the time to set up Bastiodon while our rival's Munchlax struggled against the two Bronzor, then defeated the rest of their Pokemon alongside Infernape. The battle with Cyrus was next, which I was nervous about for two reasons. One, his Pokemon were pretty high leveled, and two, his Honchro had the move Embargo, countering our X-Item strategy. However, I had a plan up my sleeve. We boosted Bastiodon's stats with Iron Defense, but Honchro used one Embargo, then used Taunt as the Embargo countdown was about to run out. Taunt prevents the opponent from using status moves like Embargo, but it only lasts 3-5 to five turns, so we boosted Bastiodon's speed within this period. Now, whenever Taunt runs out, we can outspeed Honchro and use Taunt again allowing us to freely boost our stats and easily defeat Cyrus' team. We then encountered the legendary Pokemon Palkia, but immediately fled to Sunny Shore City. While there, we challenged the last gym leader Volkner, and his electric type stood no chance against our Torterra. Unfortunately, this battle didn't record properly, but all we did was use a couple X items on Torterra and sweep with Earthquake. Some of the trainers in Victory Road were intimidating, but luckily, the trainers we were required to fight were not, allowing us to easily overcome this obstacle and enter the Pokemon League. Before we could fight the Elite Four, our rival stopped us for one last battle. This time, however, his team was much more frightening, compelling us to prepare accordingly for the difficult match. We led with Bastiodon to take the Intimidate and bait a close combat from Seraptor, then switched into Torterra. We were able to give 1x speed and 1x attack to Torterra before Seraptor used U-Turn to swap it to Heracross. This was a dangerous Pokemon, as all of Torterra's moves would be not very effective against it, and its high attack stat would allow it to deal a good amount of damage to Torterra. So, we equipped Ground with a move Natural Gift and a Grepa Berry, giving it a 70 power flying type move to one-shot the Pug fighting type. Seraptor came back out allowing us to use some more X items before it eventually swapped into Inferno. However, since we had enough time to safely boost our stats, this was easily defeated with an Earthquake. After some more X items, we took out Staraptor with Strength, and Floatzel, Roserade, and Snorlax with Earthquake. One battle down, five more to go. The first Elite Four battle was with Eren, the Bug-type user. He led with his Dust Ox, which was completely walled by our Bastiodon. We boosted our stats, then took out Dustox, Heracross, and Beautifly with Flamethrower, Vespaquen with Ancient Power, and Drapion with Earthquake. Next up was the Ground-type trainer Bertha. She led with Quagsire, we led with Torterra, and like the previous battle, we set up with X items, then took out all of her Pokemon with Giga Dream. I was most nervous for the battle with Flint, as he led with a Rapidash that knew Flare Blitz and Sunny Day. Not only would a Flare Blitz in the Sun deal a large amount of damage, its recoil damage could eventually cause Rapidash to take itself out, allowing Flint to bring out his more dangerous Pokemon Infernape. We led with Bastiodon, who we taught some very important moves to before the battle, namely Rain Dance and Torment. Torment would prevent Rapidash from using the same move twice in a row for the entire battle, stopping it from using Flare Blitz continuously. Luckily, Rapidash began by using Solar Beam, allowing us to safely use Torment and 1x speed. We used another X speed as Rapidash set up Sunny Day, then outsped it with Rain Dance as it used Flare Blitz, having the damaged Fire type moves dealt. Since we now always outspeed Rapidash, we essentially prevent it from ever using a Sunny Day powered Flare Blitz, allowing us to safely boost our stats with X items. After this, we used Ancient Power on Rapidash, Earthquake on Infernape and Celix, another Ancient Power on Driftblim, and a final Earthquake on Lopunny. Lucian was next and sent out his Mr. Mind. But since Torterra could tank its psychics, we were able to safely boost our Pokemon stats. After using Crunch on Mr. Mime, Earthquake on Medicham, 
to three more crunches on Alakazam, Durathorig, and Bronzong. We defeated the Elite Four and prepared to battle Cynthia. Cynthia led with her Spear Tooth, which only had Silver Wind, Dark Pulse, and Psychic as attacking moves, all not very effective against Bastiodon. However, its last move was Embargo, prohibiting us from boosting our stats with X items or healing with potions. However, we already had a plan to deal with Embargo from the Battle of Cyrus, using Taunt to prevent the opponent from using the move in the first place. Bastiodon outsped Spear Tooth, allowing us to start setting up right away. Cynthia tried to stop us by using Spiritomb's ability Pressure to decrease the amount of power points Taunt had, but we were able to boost most of our stats up to plus 6 regardless. In a last ditch effort to disrupt our strategy, she heartlessly forced her Pokemon to try to take itself out with Struggle, but we put it out of its misery with Earthquake. Cynthia then sent out Gastrodon, but we had a plan for this Pokemon too. Before the battle, we gave Bastiodon the move Natural Gift, and with a Pineapp Berry, this move became a 70 power Grass type move allowing us to easily knock out the water ground type. She sent out Lucario, which went down to an Earthquake, and then Garchomp, which went down to an Ice Beam. Ilotic was next, and despite our plus 6 attack stat, it narrowly survived an Earthquake, yet couldn't knock us out with Surf thanks to our plus 6 special defense stat. Cynthia tried to heal, but knew she was delaying the inevitable, and allowed us to take Milotic out with Ice Beam. Finally, Cynthia sent out Roserade, which again, fainted to Ice Beam. And with that, we had officially beat a permadeath run of Pokemon Pro without catching any Pokemon. But the challenge wasn't over. We still had to collect 8 more types. After returning to our house, we decided to complete the Pokedex. Sort of. Obviously completing the Pokedex requires catching a lot of Pokemon, but we were focusing on completing the scene category of the Sinnoh Dex. During this run, we battled almost all of the trainers in the game filling a lot of unique pages in the Pokedex, but we were still missing 5 key Pokemon. The first Pokemon we needed to find had the Pokedex number 114, unknown. So, we traveled to the Silesian Ruins, ran around for a bit, and encountered the Pokemon. Easy. The next 3 Pokemon had the Pokedex numbers 146, 147, and 148, the Lake Trio. These were pretty easy to find too, as Uxie was in Lake Aquity, Vesper in Lake Verde, and Azolf in Lake Valor. Finally, we needed to find Pokedex number 149, Dialga. While we cannot encounter the mascot of Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl, we could still add the Pokemon to our Pokedex by going to Celestic Town. After entering one of the houses there, an old woman showed us a picture of the legendary Pokemon, completing the Sinnoh Dex. We went to Sandgem Town to show our completed Pokedex to Rowan, but surprisingly met Professor Oak there, who conveniently arrived right after us. He upgraded our Sinnoh Dex to the National Pokedex, opening up new opportunities for us to get different Pokemon. We went to Heart Home City and met Bibi, the system administrator for the PC boxes. After being impressed with our new National Pokedex, she offered us an Eevee. While you can get this gift Pokemon right away in Platinum, you have to own the National Pokedex to get it in Pearl. In order to beat this challenge, we needed a female Eevee, so we reset until we finally received one on the 14th try. Eevee is in the field egg group, so it needs to breed with another Pokemon in that group to produce eggs. Luckily, Lucario is also in the field egg group, so we put both Eevee and Lucario in the daycare and waited until they laid 5 eggs. After hatching all of the eggs, we had a full party of Eevees, but not for long, as Eevee is notorious for its many evolutions. We got a Thunderstone from Sunny Shore City to evolve one Eevee into Jolteon, used a Firestone we got from the underground in the beginning to evolve a second into Flareon, and got a Waterstone from Route 213 to evolve a third into Vaporeon. We then took the fourth Eevee to the Icy Rock on Route 217, leveled it up, and evolved it into Glaceon. As for the fifth and sixth Eevees, it was a little more complicated, as we needed to raise them up to max friendship and evolve them during a certain time of day. And after two long hours of fighting and poppin making, we evolved the fifth Eevee into Espeon and the sixth into Umbreon, giving us 15 out of the 17 types. To get the final two types, we had to revisit an area of the game we hadn't gone to in a while, the underground. The last time we traveled here, we were searching for armor fossils, but now that we have the National Pokedex, we are able to find many more fossils from previous generations, such as the Helix Fossil, Dome Fossil, Old Amber, Fruit Fossil, and Claw Fossil. All of these fossils are rare items in the underground, so it would take a lot of luck to get the two we needed. 
we actually found the first of the two quickly, a claw fossil after only 40 minutes of searching. We took this to the mining museum in Orberg City and revived it into Anorith, our bug type Pokemon. We didn't get as lucky with the second fossil though, as this took another 6 hours to find. In this time, we got 3 helix fossils, 4 armor fossils, 5 root fossils, and 5 dome fossils before getting the one old amber we wanted. We took this to the mining museum and revived it into the flying type Aerodactyl, completing our goal of collecting a Pokemon of every single type without catching any wild Pokemon. And that's it! I hope you all enjoyed this challenge as much as I did. If you want to watch runs like this live, I stream challenges and Pokemon games on Twitch all the time. I also plan to post more videos like this in the future, so subscribe if you'd like to see more. Otherwise, thanks for watching!